Hello and welcome once again to the Justin Center podcast. And I just want to give you all a quick reminder, as we always do, that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask that you consider becoming a regular contributor. You can go to justcenter.org, go to our donate page and give any amount that you desire. You can become a monthly uh, donor through Patreon or other means. And uh, you can also give a one-time gift if you prefer. Uh, you we really do need your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means any gifts that you give are tax deductible. All right, so we are uh, getting into our our talk today, uh, and today is a this is a talk on uh, on Hegel. Now, uh, in this Makers of the Modern World series, so far, at least as you, if you're listening to them in the time that they come out you know, on the playlist, I'm actually going to put, be putting them in chronological order in terms of these figures. Uh, so you may be a little mixed up because uh, I know I'm not doing these in chronological order. I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but. Um, if you have not yet uh, listened to or watched uh, the talk on, on Kant, that may be helpful to give you some context in terms of what we're talking about uh, with Hegel. But this is the, the seventh of these now that I have recorded. And, and I will say that as I begin this talk on Hegel, out of all of the figures that I have discussed at this point, Hegel is the one who... Uh, I feel in some ways the least equipped to talk about. And, and the reason for that is not because I haven't spent an extensive amount of time in Hegel. I have. Uh, or a, a, an extensive amount of time in secondary sources on Hegel. I have. More so than most of the other figures I've talked about thus far. Uh, but simply because his thought is, is so comprehensive, so large in its scope and its scale, that it's extremely difficult to summarize Hegel's perspectives within an hour-long talk. And I know that within this talk, I'm going to be simplifying some things. Everything I say could be nuanced. Every single thing I say could be debated, depending on the Hegel scholar that you're talking to. And so Hegel is one of these figures who has so many schools of thought that expand and extend from his own writings. And I've said this with a lot of the other figures too, because, you know, Kant is is the same way. I think Kant is far more understandable, however, than Hegel. And Hegel is a figure who immediately after his lifetime, two schools of thought develop uh, under his, and they're not such unified schools, but it's often been described as unified schools, uh, but using his philosophy as a basis. So it's a rarity to get a philosopher, an important thinker, where you have a whole school of thought that follows that thinker. Uh, but it says something especially about that thinker when you have numerous schools of thought all claiming to interpret him correctly, and they all come to very different conclusions. So on nearly every point, there are schools of thought in Hegel's Hegel scholarship or schools of thought that develop from Hegel uh, that take various approaches to his writings. And a lot of that is the obscurantism of Hegel's own writing. He's not an easy uh, person to read. And I said this about Kant, but I think Hegel is far more difficult than Kant is. Um, Kant is, is wordy uh, and his arguments can be a bit convoluted if you're not used, used to them. Um, but I, I think that once you kind of get Kant's style down uh, you and you really understand his systematic way of thinking that, that you can navigate it, I would not say easily, <laughs> but navigate it well enough. Hegel is, is a different story. Um, if you try to read uh, the phenomenology of spirit or his other writings, his earlier writings actually are much more accessible. He has some really theological writings, which aren't, aren't as complex. Um, his knowledge was so vast that he makes allusions and references to all sorts of other uh, literary material, historical events, uh, artistic material offhand in such a way that he expects you to know what he's talking about. And most people do not. <laughs> so it, it becomes very difficult. And the way that Hegel uses terms, uh, he has a, a very distinct way of using a variety of terms that you kind of have to understand and get used to, to really understand what's going on here. So rather than just jumping into the phenomenology of spirit, which I do not recommend doing uh, without an extensive amount of background, I couldn't really navigate the text without reading some commentaries on the text first to really understand what he's what he's countering, what his ideas are, um, what he means by various terms, because he doesn't all explain that himself. So uh, it, he's a figure that I recommend reading. If you want to read Hegel, uh, I recommend going to some secondary sources, introductory texts about Hegel first, and then jumping into uh, the phenomenology of spirit. If you if you have any desire to, I will tell you it's not an easy text. 
but it's a very influential one. Uh, so Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Uh, GWF Hegel is usually how it's summarized uh, because people don't usually say the entirety of his names or we just call him Hegel more often. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, now just a little bit as we start here about Hegel's life. Now, I'm not going to say a ton here in terms of his life because I want to spend enough time on his thought. Uh, that, that we really need. But he's born in 1770 in Stuttgart, Württemberg, which is in southwest Germany, if you're not familiar with German geography. Uh, he's raised in, in a middle-class family, so he's not from a particularly well-educated family. His, his father uh, is a bureaucrat, but a rather low-level one. Uh, he is, throughout his childhood years, he reads extensively. And it's recognized very early on that he has extensive intellectual gifts. And, and he does. You don't have to like Hegel or agree with his philosophy to recognize that he was quite an intellectually gifted individual. Uh, so uh, th those gifts are recognized right away. Now, he goes off uh, to, to school to study at Tumigen. Now, if you're not familiar with Tumigen, it is a very influential um, theological school in Germany. Uh, Tumigen really becomes the center of Protestant liberalism in many ways later and criticisms of scripture, a more naturalistic approach uh, to, to theology. But he goes to school at Tumigen to study for the pastor. He is a Lutheran, as are many of the individuals that we have discussed here in the series so far, because we're talking about um, kind of the intellectual context of, of Germany, and uh, Germany is largely Lutheran. So he is studying for the pastorate in, in the Lutheran church. Now, while he's there, he starts taking a lot of courses in philosophy. He's really more interested in philosophy than he is in theology. Now, he does have some theological writings. I think we'll see as if, if you read Hegel's writings, uh, you, you see pretty pretty clearly that he has a theological background. So theology certainly informs the work of Hegel. It's something that he thinks about rather deeply and is going to impact his later conclusions. And there's a lot of debate about exactly how it impacts his conclusions or how Christian his system is or not. <laughs> there are atheistic interpretations of Hegel. There are ones that affirm that Hegel was indebted to, to Christian orthodoxy in various ways. So this is one of those areas where there, there's a lot of debate. But it's very clear that he is influenced by his, his Lutheran theology, and it starts raising a lot of the questions and ideas um, that he seeks to answer in, in his own uh, philosophy. So uh, after school, he works as, as a tutor. He doesn't really want to do that. He wants to be a professor, but he is, he's tutoring. He tutors in a couple different different areas uh, until his father's death, which is in 1799. And uh, 1799 is a very important year, as we're going to talk about when we look at Schleiermacher, because that is a year that we could say is foundational for the development of Protestant liberalism in Germany. And and I find it interesting that this occurs in, in the same year. These figures overlap, and they're both going to be highly influential for the development of all uh, theology. Um, past their own lifetimes. Whether Hegel himself was a theologian, uh, you know, is a debatable question, but it's it's not debatable that Hegel had a profound imp impact upon the discipline of theology in various ways. So uh, when his father dies, he inherits some money. And after he inherits some money, um, he uh, is then able to take a position uh, lecturing. And the reason is because this is a volunteer position. He really wanted to lecture and he gets this volunteer position because now he has a, an income after his father's death. So he stops tutoring. Um, he starts lecturing for a little while without pay. Uh, he still runs out of money rather quickly. As we said, his father wasn't a particularly wealthy man or anything like that. So it's not like he inherited some vast amount of wealth. Uh, he ends up getting married in 1811 uh, from a woman that's that's far younger than he is. Uh, he ends up, he has two sons with this woman. He has three sons in total because uh, he had a prior ex extramarital affair. Uh, well, I guess he wasn't married at all, but he was, a, uh, you know, he, he had a child with a woman that he was with. Prior to that, so he has three sons. Uh, his sons ended up actually being rather successful uh, and in influential themselves in their own spheres. Um, he then becomes a professor at Heidelberg in 1817. So this is his full professorship, and he begins really, ex when he's in Heidelberg, he begins expanding upon his thoughts, uh, and that's where he writes a lot of the more detailed expositions of his whole system of philosophy. Uh, he gets cholera 
1831 and passes away. So there's the basic details of, of Hegel's biography that you want to know if we're looking at, uh, at the figure of Hegel. A lot more that could be said, but again, we're going to try to jump into his thoughts uh, so we don't want to spend too much time uh, here. Okay, so influences here. We're going to talk about three major figures that impact Hegel's thought. And Hegel is, is an individual who has a bit of a journey in his own writings, uh, ideologically. So he, he's not too familiar with Kant in his early writings, and we see his encounter with Kant really shapes him. Much of the way that Kant's own thought really shifts dramatically with what he calls the Copernican Revolution when he encounters Hume. So the problems in Kant really have a profound impact uh, upon Hegel and his system of thought. We also see his movement from theology uh, into philosophy, and particularly a philosophy of history. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of what's going on uh, at this time, uh, some of the ideological influences here. So first we start with Kant. Now, as I said in our talk on Kant, every single figure following Kant is influenced by Kant in one way or another. That's just, that's just the reality of our intellectual milieu even today. Uh, I, I would say that even the questions I answer and ask are related to Kant, whether I like it or not, because Kant has formed the way that we think in the post-Enlightenment West more than just about anybody else. Uh, so this is true of, of Hegel's time. Now, Kant is at this point just growing in influence. Um, and, you know, Kant is a, is a late Enlightenment figure who ends up really outshining all other Enlightenment figures in, in his impact. So uh, Hegel also is, is German, of course, as is Kant. Uh, so he has an influence, particularly in the German Academy. Now, there's some main points in Kant and considerations of Kant that we need to think about with Hegel and, and see particular areas of, of influence from one thinker to the next. And the first point is the questions of freedom and reason that we see in Immanuel Kant. Now, uh, with the rise of Newtonian physics, at this time, we are learning a lot more about the natural world. Um, after Isaac Newton, people start to think that the world is governed by mechanical laws, just like a kind of like a machine works. It, it's just one thing happens and another thing happens. And as human beings, uh, perhaps we are just part of the machine. Now, if that's true in the ultimate sense, that means that we have no actual freedom. If we are just part of a, of a machine, if we are just biological objects, and you see these debates still going on in philosophy of mind today, um, though, of course, we're not uh, bound by Newtonian physics in the strict sense as, as they were at the time, because we understand a lot more about, about the natural world. But still, there, there is a strong mechanistic uh, natural philosophy of mind that continues to exist today among some thinkers, people like Daniel Dennett, who you may be familiar with, or Paul and Patricia Churchland. Um, but according to these thinkers, there is no such thing as human freedom. Uh, we essentially are, are machines. We're like robots. We just do what we do because of biological processes. And really, there's nothing that we can do about it. And this, of course, has a profound impact upon, upon humans, upon us, uh, because what about values and meaning and how I live my life and how I make my daily decisions? It certainly impacts the way that I would look at myself if I say I'm just a purely biological machine and I have no freedom at all. Uh, all of that is just a mere illusion. So Kant seeks to explore this notion of freedom. And a lot of thinkers do at this time. Uh, British thinkers do in, in kind of different a different sense, but we're talking in a more German sense. Um, English think thinkers tend to view uh, freedom in terms of freedom from constraint. Uh, and we see those ideas played out in the American Revolution and in, in the American concept of, of liberty. So when we're talking about freedom in someone like Kant or Hegel, we're not really talking about liberty as in freedom from constraint. Um, that would be another talk that I really do want to do on John Locke and exploring some of those notions of liberty. Um, but for Kant, freedom, what is ultimately most free is what is most rational. So rationality, and this is typical of enlightenment thought, rationality is really the, the highest value. And to be truly free is to be truly rational. So there is this one-to-one -one correlation of the rational with the free. So Kant wants to recapture this notion of freedom. He wants to move away from a purely mechanistic approach to the world where all we can say about ourselves is that we are mere machines. Um, he wants to also affirm the reality of Newtonian physics, understanding the natural world. Uh, but you can watch the Kant talk uh, or listen to the Kant talk to um, get more details there. Okay, uh, so Hegel is going to emphasize these two things as well. He has a 
he has a high view of reason. In some ways, his whole philosophy is a philosophy of the development of reason. Um, there's a saying that the rational is the real and the real is the rational, uh, which I think characterizes Hegel's approach pretty well, as well as a lot of thinkers in this era. Uh, and he's also going to think a lot about human freedom and what it means to be truly free. And Hegel is going to take from Kant that to be, to be truly free is to be truly rational. Um, okay. And and so we're going to see also he develops this whole idea of this spirit or geist, as he's going to call it, that underlies mechanical uh, reality. So mechanical, natural, biological reality is not all there is. There is a, a, a reality of meaning and purpose underneath all of that. Um, he is also going to take from Kant this this distinction between subject and object that, that we talked about with Kant with the Copernican revolution, as he describes it, uh, that Kant is rethinking the relationship between subjects, as in human subjects, and objects, or the things that we encounter in everyday experience. The rethinking of how I relate to the world around me is going to influence Hegel profoundly, though he's going to go in different directions uh, than, than Kant is, because he's going to really make the argument, and Kant does in some ways too, but just in a different way, he's going to make an argument that there isn't a strong divide between subjects and objects, that we are all really one in some, in some deeper sense. Uh, also, he gets from, from Kant this idea that we can speak about nations or people groups as subjects. So traditionally in philosophy, when we talk about a subject, you're thinking of yourself, or you're thinking of an, of an individual, especially in someone like Descartes. Uh, but in Kant, you start to see this shift where, and this is in his political philosophy, where he, Kant lays out what becomes the basis for the United Nations that we have today, um, where Kant starts to speak about nations themselves as subjects. So he's thinking of subjects more in a corporate sense than just in an individual sense. And that corporate understanding of subjects is going to profoundly influence uh, influence Hegel. All right, then we have Johann Fichte. Uh, and, and Fichte here uh, is, is the one who's Picture in this image. Uh, Fichte, is, his years are 1762 to 1814. Uh, and so we have these two major figures that are influential on Hegel's thought. We have Fichte and Schelling. And Fichte and Schelling are uh, German idealists, like Kant is. Idealist meaning that that which is uh, in the realm of ideas is the most real, not just the physical, biological world that we encounter. The most real is the realm of ideas. So this goes all. This has a, a you know philosophical roots all the way back in Plato, but they do different things with it. So these figures are influential on on Hegel's thought. Uh, Fichte, uh, essentially, in in Kant's thought, we had this distinction between the noumena and the phenomena. Okay, the noumena being the thing in itself, what th what objects really are in themselves. And the phenomenal realm is how those objects impact us. In other words, how I encounter the world. So uh, what I experience is, is, you know, what, say, if I have this desk in front of me, I'm experiencing the feel of the desk, the look of the desk, and all of that kind of stuff. But I don't know what the desk is in itself. All I know is how it appears to me in my sense experience. Um, Kant says the objective world or the world of objects really does exist but we have no access to it. So we have no access to the thing in itself, what the world really is in itself. Fink kind of goes the extra step and says, well, the not noumenal doesn't exist at all. So you can just kind of throw that out. We don't really know that an objective world exists. Everything is just phenomena. So the only thing that really exists is things sense, is sense impression. So how things appear to me, how I subjectively receive them. And he would say, this is true even of the individual self. I don't know what I am in myself. In fact, I probably don't even actually exist as one single individual self. That's just a perception of self. We only have a perception of self from the phenomena, what we think and hear and feel and all of those kind of things. Um, but ultimate reality, Fick would say, he would say he's not getting rid of the notion of a subject or self at all. He's saying, well, there is this absolute ego, this absolute single individual self that underlies all things. And all of us are really experiencing the world through this singular absolute ego or the single singular absolute I. So my individuality doesn't really exist. Your individuality doesn't exist. We're, we're all just understanding things through some um, singular, what we call monistic perspective. Okay, so then we have uh, Friedrich Schelling. Uh, Schelling uh, is... 
really actually the creator of some of the primary categories by which Hegel himself is understood. And I think there's there's been a conflation in some ways of, she of Schelling and Hegel's thought. But um, Schelling follows some of the same lines of thought as, as Fick does. He says there is an absolute identity. So there is an absolute identity between subject and object, meaning he's he's taking away any distance between subject and object, me and the things I encounter in the world. He's saying that these are not... Uh, these are not fundamentally distinct things. There is an identity between me and the things I encounter. We're all part of the same thing. Uh, he talks about this absolute in a similar way that Fichte does. We have this absolute ego. Uh, this absolute has the absolute oneness, the absolute thing that exists, has negation within itself. What I mean by that is it has, it has contradictions in itself, we might say. It has positives and negatives. Think about like the yin-yang kind of idea. Um, and this develops the notion of what we call the dialectic that we find in Hegel. All right. And I know this is all very convoluted. It's very hard to understand this. I'm trying to explain this as easy as I can. So I, I find this overwhelming more than any other talk that I have given the, thus far in this series. And that's just because it's the nature of, of German idealism. It's so bizarre and difficult to understand. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is one of those things when people start studying this, uh, there was like, well, why? Like, why, why are you coming to these kinds of conclusions? And, but there is reason behind it. But I think if you don't understand all of this, these discussions leading up to it, leading up to Hegel, it's hard to understand Hegel. Um, okay, so Hegel's metaphysics. Uh, so Hegel's idea of what is real. Uh, and that, that's going to be central to, to his, his thought. The Phenomenology of Spirit is where a lot of this is laid out. That's his most famous text. It's not the only important text that Hegel writes, but that's the one that has the most lasting um, significance. Okay, so let's start by talking about Geist. Um, now, Geist, this term Geist, is translated as spirit or mind. So phenomenology of spirit is really the phenomenology of Geist. And there is no exact English equivalent of Geist, and so it's translated as spirit or it's translated as mind. And neither of those um, quite get at uh, the, the, the real meaning of Geist. So Geist is, which makes it hard to, to explain what Geist is. <laughs> okay, we don't even have a word to explain what you're talking about exactly. Uh, so like we find in, in Heidegger, some of the terminology that he uses, just there's no translation for it in English. So you got to kind of approximate as best you can. Um, so we have the, the natural world, which is the the biological reality, what we're talking about with Newtonian physics, we have the world as it's governed just by laws. Okay, so the natural world exists in Hegel. He's not saying it doesn't exist. Um, but that's not all there is to reality. And he wants to say there's got to be more to reality than just this, these mechanistic laws. Because as human beings, we really, we know underneath there's something more than that, right? There's meaning, there's purpose, there's value. Um, things that religion appeals to, uh, things that, you know, Hegel is going to understand through his Lutheran upbringing is part of, of, of a Lutheran understanding of the world, that God has created the world and he's created it with, with purposes in view. And so while there are uh, thinkers at this point in Germany who are rejecting their Lutheran orthodoxy altogether and saying, well, there is no meaning and purpose. It's all just subjective. Hegel doesn't want to do that. He says, no, there's something profoundly true about that. Um, but he's going to reject, you know, the Lutheran Orthodox conclusion and come to his own conclusion. Now, as a Lutheran Orthodox thinker, I <laughs> think he's wrong, but, uh, but, but it's important to understand the, the background there. Okay. So, um, he, so he's challenging that Newtonian physics is all that there is to reality. Uh, and so we see this challenge that says, basically, there's no such thing as freedom. Um, everything is just mechanical. And with Kant, Hegel is going to want to say, no, I want to affirm human freedom. I want to affirm human value and human feeling and meaning and all of the things that just characterize our lives day by day as something real. And so there is, yes, this natural world. But underneath that, there is this other reality that he refers to as the Geist, which is, is, is often translated as a world spirit. This is similar to what we just talked about in Fick and Schelling with this um, kind of absolute ego or self. So uh, this Geist is 
is what's hard to explain, but it's essentially, it, it's a combination of mind um, and spirit. So there's a kind of spirituality to it ish, depending on how you interpret Hegel, because there are different interpretations of what he means by this, uh, which is one of the most difficult things to, to figure out. Um, but this is the realm of, of meaning. This is the realm of consciousness. Okay, so maybe consciousness is uh, perhaps the the kind of most obvious point that differentiates spirit from the natural world or this geist from the natural world. This is the realm of consciousness. Uh, because even still today, if you if you look at mechanistic materialist philosophers and their explanations of consciousness, uh, they they really are are extremely lacking. I mean, they they just don't explain how we understand the world. And and philosophers of mind are increasingly understanding and, and co coming to conclusions that consciousness just is not a physical thing, <laughs> and and to explain it purely in physical terms just doesn't really make sense. Uh, and, and the explanations that we have that go that route are just missing so much about basic, fundamental, first person experience. Um, all right, so think about consciousness, right? The consciousness underneath all all things, the the recognition of self, self reflection, all all of these things that um, simply cannot be attributable to to that which is mechanical. Uh, now, the the geist or this underlying reality of all things, this consciousness, as we may call it, is to be understood in terms of a very ancient philosophical debate. And this ancient philosophical debate is the debate between being and becoming. And I'll summarize this very quickly. If you want to get more into this, I have my History of Western Thought videos talk about this with my Heraclitus video, my Plato video, if you want to explore more. Um, but you have this debate between philosophers about what is the most real. Okay, so uh, Plato says that which is the most real is the realm of unchanging ideas. So that which is the most real is unchanging. They are objective truths. They're objective realities that always are. They're eternal. Um, and they are universals. Heraclitus, who was an earlier thinker, uh, had he had a very famous saying, which you may have, have heard before. Heraclitus said, a man cannot step into the same river twice. And the point that he was making with that is, you know, the river is constantly flowing. And every time you step into the same river, you, you probably call it the same name. You think of it as the same river, but it's never exactly the same. So history, reality is always in flux. And he did believe that God existed. He spoke about Zeus uh, as this underlying reality, but it's a reality of change. So for Heraclitus, ultimate reality is not just physical stuff. It's something underneath that that guides it. But that guiding force is one that changes. Uh, he wouldn't say it's not totally non-physical either. Plato does that, but Heraclitus doesn't quite get, get that far. Later Greek philosophers get to that point. Um, so there's this old debate that Hegel's jumping into. And instead of saying that being is the ultimate reality. See, Kant, in some ways, tries to bring back Plato's ideas, though in a different form, uh, because Kant is saying the universal truths of reason are what really matter. That's the ultimate truth. He's trying to find objective, universal uh, truths. And this is what he does with morality, the categorical imperative, this notion that that which is, is most moral, that which is moral, is what is universal. It's always true and will never change. So truth is these rational facts that are always the case. Hegel is going to challenge that and move toward the Heraclitan view, uh, a view which really is not prominent in the history of philosophy post-Heraclitus until we really get to, to Hegel. And that is history of philosophy, at least in the Western world we're talking about. So he is making a rather radical shift from where philosophy has been since Plato, basically. Uh, and he's saying, actually, no, Plato was wrong. Reality is historical movement. Reality is to be found in that which changes and grows. So this is what creates what we refer to as Hegel's historicism. And that is this idea that truth is to be found within history and within particular epochs or time periods uh, in history when things change. So instead of talking about, say, universal moral truths like Kant does in terms of the categorical imperative, we're not going to ask, you know, what is universally rational? We're going to ask, what is this time period? What is this society? What is this culture? What do they think about things? And how does morality develop there? So we're locating truth within the historical process itself. And so for Hegel, 
the geist or this underworld, this world spirit changes through time. It is constantly changing, but it is changing in a process of self-development. So it is increasing in its growth. It is becoming more aware of itself. It is becoming greater. So this, for Hegel, explains just a lot of our studies of history. And I think it could be appealing to a lot of people today who say, you know, people talk today, uh, you know, about, you know, this is, you know, this is 2022. How can you still think X? You know, the, the idea behind that is we're constantly learning more and becoming better and more moral. And so the things that we believed in the past, those are obviously wrong, right? There's this belief that we are kind of universally just progressing. We know better than people in the past did. Uh, really comes from Hegel's notion that the world is in this process of self-development. It's growing. It's constantly getting better. And that occurs through this underlying geist as it comes to know itself. It's becoming more rational. So that means that there is there are no objective, universal, unchanging truths that are from time to time. It's That's part of historical process. And there are no universal morals, something like a categorical imperative in Kant. That is simply that which develops in time as the world spirit develops in time, which, again, I think you see reflected a lot today in the discourse over various issues of morality or sexuality, uh, where we speak not in terms of, of universal truths and, and engage in them by means of rational argumentation, but we think more in terms of, well, our world has changed, therefore we can do this now and we used to think this was bad, but now we know better. So instead of starting from there are universal moral principles, there are natural laws, and arguing from there, we argue from, well, this is the historical time period we're in, so obviously this is the way things are. Um, Hegel further denies Kant's view that individual concrete particulars make up reality. Uh, and this is not just Kant's view, this is going back to Plato. So this idea that reality is made up of, of, the, of concrete things, and he says, no, it's not, uh, reality is not just individual things, but all is essentially one. Everything is essentially one. So it's a monistic system. That's like Heraclitus. Monistic meaning all things are one. So a lot of the ancient Greek philosophers believed that all things were one. A lot of, of Eastern philosophies have similar ideas as well. They're, they're monistic. And so a lot of the ancient Greeks, you know, Heraclitus uh, or Thales and others tried to figure out what is the one thing that makes up all things. And, and uh, Heraclitus said fire is the essence of reality. You see fire as divinity and fire is something that never stays still. Fire is constantly changing. And, and so that for, for Heraclitus was, uh, was the nature of, of reality. Heraclitus didn't have this, at least as, as far as I can think in the writings of Heraclitus that we have, which are not very many, um, he didn't have this progressive view that we find in Hegel. So Hegel's view is things are getting better. Heraclitus's view is things just change, not necessarily in a, in a positive sense. Um, okay, so now we get to Hegel's dialectic. Hegel's dialectic is, is the most well-known um, area of his thought, but often misunderstood and to be honest, it's very hard to explain. <laughs> it, it is. It's just hard to explain. Um, okay. So let's, I'm going to do the best I can in a brief time period. So, okay. Re relations in classical philosophy, um, if you look at, say, Aristotle, how one thing relates to another thing, those are, are accidental qualities. What I mean by that is uh, if a relation is an accidental quality, relations don't define what a thing is. That doesn't mean they're unimportant but a thing retains its essence regardless of how it relates to another thing. Okay, so identities are found within things themselves and relations are separate objects that really exist coming into contact with each other. They can change each other for sure, but relations do not define what a thing is. For Hegel, relations are not, we're not talking about external relations. We're not talking about just one object bumping into another object and relating to it. Instead, we are saying that how a thing relates to other things or how a person relates to other persons, those are actually essential to an essence or an identity. So how I relate to something defines who I am. So I am defined by my relations. 
And this makes sense within his monistic perspective because all things are really one. So there are no just purely external relations because we're all part of one unified thing in Hegel's view. Um, so he would say that internal relations, so relations within things, make a thing what it is. So an essence is defined by its relations, and that includes tensions. So it, that includes conflict. So a thing is defined by its relations, and often in those relations comes conflict. And the world spirit develops through this conflict because that conflict is overcome as this world spirit grows. So this is what is often summarized in uh, Hegel as this thesis, antithesis, synthesis perspective. Now, to be clear, thesis, antithesis, synthesis never shows up in Hegel. His most famous idea isn't even in his writings. Uh, <laughs> strange as that is. Uh, it, it does show up. I, I believe it shows up in Schelling um, first. But it does end up being a tool that some uh, immediate followers of Hegel start to use to describe his thought. So there's some debate as to how accurate it is to his thought. Uh, and, and I tend to think that it is helpful because this is so convoluted. I think it's a helpful way to explain things, but it's not exact or comprehensive. So it's kind of a simplification of what he says. Um, but here's, here's the idea. The idea is, you know, you posit one idea. One idea shows up in history. Someone says, I don't like that. And they posit the opposite idea. And then those two things kind of battle it out. And then out of that comes this conclusion that is a synthesis of these two ideas. And that is, is kind of what he's talking about when we speak about this dialectical relationship that includes these tensions. So the world spirit has conflicts and overcomes those conflicts. But it's all within this geist or this world spirit. So it's not like a person over here and a person over here that are separate from one another because the tensions are essential to reality itself. Reality includes those tensions and the overcoming of those tensions. Um, okay, which then Kierkegaard is going to challenge later. But So the absolute or this... Uh, th th this this absolute that underlies all things comes to this self-realization. So the process of the world spirit or the process of the geist, geist is one of continual self-realization. So the absolute, this world spirit, this geist grows. It comes to know itself better. And it does that through growth in rationality and freedom. Those are essential. And so you see this influence of Kant on Hegel's thought as he's saying it becomes more rational. So we become more rational as time goes on because the as the Geist is coming to know itself, it becomes more rational. And as it is more rational, it then acts more rationally and thereby is more free. Okay. Um, Hegel is going to describe a reality in three aspects. And Hegel uses threes a lot. I do think this is his theological background, his Trinitarian background, and he uses the Trinity in some ways to, to describe uh, reality, though he has an a odd interpretation of the Trinity. But um, these are three aspects of, of reality that are essential. One is, is logic. So we're talking about rationality. He's still not really going to be talking about universal principles of rationality. He's going to place that within the historical process. Um, and then he's going to talk about, about nature, um, but nature, not just in the sense that nature runs its course, but also the Geist starts to come to self-understanding. So we're talking about this, this growth and understanding of natural laws and how nature functions. So uh, we, we grow, the Geist grows through reason and self-understanding as nature. We begin to understand the reality of nature that's showing up in, uh, in his historical epoch. And then we have spirit. Um, spirit is the underlying fundamental reality, which is consciousness. We have subjects and objects, which are really one. He's not going to totally conflate subject and object, but they're both part of the spirit. Um, logic and nature are both encapsulated by spirit as this underlying reality. Okay, uh, now we could talk about history. Uh, history as development, because history is really at the core of Hegel's thought. Um, so uh, the Geist, 
develops through various historical epochs in different places. So he's going to explore the history of the world. Now, Hegel's history is it's limited. <laughs> um, the amount of historiographical understanding that we have now compared to Hegel is is far more vast. So it's it's a bit simplistic, but. He has a, a rough kind of history of the world where he describes these different uh, historical time periods where things develop. And in these, these time periods, we see certain you know, ideas tend to be rather uh, predominant. And that's what we see when we look at time periods shifting is the world spirit coming to its own self-understanding. Uh, so we could think, and when we do this today, when we think of time periods, uh, I mean, we certainly, we speak about something like romanticism. Uh, we talk about the in enlightenment, the growth of rationalism. Um, we speak about uh, eras of revolution. If, you know, we could talk about the 1960s as a very significant era where the world changes a lot. And so we can, and historians do, break down time periods by kind of the... the the general milieu of that age, what people are thinking, what's generally going on. And we can see connections between cultures, connections between individuals in, in various places and in various ways to say, well, there are similarities going on here and there. So this, what we're seeing in Hegel's view, and we see, um, say, a time period like the Reformation where, well, Luther, Luther's reforms show up and then Zwingli is doing something similar at the same time with the rise of humanism. And we have all of these things going on in Western Europe that you know, maybe this is the spirit coming to its self-understanding and it's working through these individual figures so that these ideas are just kind of in the air at these different ages. I don't know what that means for our age, but okay. Um, so we can kind of get where Hegel's getting at. I think when you study history, you can see what he's talking about here. Um, but the center of these historical epochs are the states, as he's going to call them. He's going to talk about the state. And the state includes nations and cultures. So we're not just talking about individuals. We're not just talking about academic institutions. So he's not just saying the realm of the philosophers is where all of this happens. Like, no, the, the spirit comes to self-understanding just through history. The philosophers are there, but so are you know states and laws and the morality of people and the arts. All of this is interconnected because everything is just connected to the growth of this geist or this world spirit. Um, sometimes this geist comes to realize itself through particularly great men. So Hegel is going to um, single out some individual figures that uh, that he says are going to be kind of examples of the Geist in individual people. Now, this doesn't mean that these people are conscious of being that, okay? So it doesn't mean that, you know, a one of these figures that's mentioned is going to think like, oh, I am the embodiment of the Geist, or I'm particularly special in doing this or that. And it also doesn't even mean that they self-consciously are thinking through the implications of what they're doing. They may be doing things for the wrong reasons, but it doesn't really matter because the Geist is using individuals to come to its own self-understanding and to do certain things. So uh, some of these great men, we have, we have some examples that show up in Hegel. Uh, Julius Caesar is one, Alexander the Great. So we could think about you know, political leaders that shape the world. Uh, Martin Luther, you know, as a German uh, and who was raised Lutheran, he's certainly going to see Luther's impact upon upon the world. And of course, Hegel himself. <laughs> Hegel, Hegel sees himself as uh, one of these uh, individuals who is very, very important for the history of philosophy, just as philosophers tend to think. You know, we saw this with Kant. And he's it's like, I am the new Copernicus. I am changing all of philosophy. And hey, he did. So maybe he was right. But uh, still a bit of an arrogant thing to say. Nietzsche does the same thing. Uh, but philosophers tend to think pretty highly of themselves. And, and we see this here. So he, he is the embodiment of the Geist here. And, and he, he sees in some ways his philosophy as really the ultimate end. This is what all philosophy has been leading to is the writing of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And as we know, everybody stopped writing philosophy since then. Just kidding. No. Uh, but however, I will say this. Hegel is, is the last philosopher who really attempts a comprehens comprehensive system of everything. Uh, that's not to say that he's successful in doing that. But Hegel does develop a comprehensive system of all of reality to explain everything. And hardly any philosophers do that. Uh, you know, Plato does that. Aristotle does that. You know, Aquinas does that. Um, and we could say that about Kant as well, does that. But 
that's really not attempted after Hegel. Um, people, philosophy was in very different directions post Hegel, but uh, so in some ways, maybe he is, maybe he is the end. Uh, he, he's the last one to um, really have a comprehensive philosophical system. Okay, so let's think about the development of of the Geist uh, in in terms of just a, an analogy. Now, he does use the analogy of a seed, right, of, of the seed growing into a plant and continuing to grow and flourish and blossom. Um, uh, but we could also talk about this, the Geist developing just as a human being develops. So, I mean, you know, you grow from infancy. There's this natural process of growth that you have. Certain things are going to happen. You're going to learn to walk. You're going to learn to talk. You're going to, you know, build friendships. You're going to do the things that people do. The body grows in particular ways. You can't, like, stop the body from just growing taller naturally. Uh, it, it is what it does, right? So um, there is this kind of natural process of development that we understand. And we also understand that in human development, oftentimes we develop through setbacks, we develop through negative experiences and circumstances that happen to us. Sometimes the negative has to happen in order for us to develop more consciously as people. Or we, we have to have negative experiences, right? You have to experience pain in order to understand how to deal with pain. And the development of this Geist is the same way. So Hegel is not going to see, see tragedies that happen or horrible things that happen because history is largely the history of famine and war and death. Um, it, so as he sees these things, this doesn't negate this progress, but he's saying the painful things that happen, this is part of progress. And that's also part of the negation within the world spirit that it has to overcome to become more aware of itself and more rational. Um, so let's talk a little bit then about uh, what Hegel says about religion. Uh, and it, as I said, that he has this this Lutheran background, and he initially go, wants to go into the ministry. Um, now, in in the context of his, so in, in the context of his um, growth of the Geist, he's going to say religious development is essentially part of that. So the the religious development that that grows throughout world history. And again, he's pretty limited in terms of what he knows because it's only after Hegel that we really have this uh, really intensive study of the history of religions that really is largely due to Hegel's system that it, that it grows in its, its popularity and uh, people start, start studying that field more extensively. But um, human religion, he sees, goes through this process of getting better, right? It starts very polytheistic. People are worshiping many gods, those many gods are just like people. They're full of all sorts of flaws. Um, they're exclusive faiths in that they're exclusive to one particular people group. So you have like tribal gods. Um, but we see throughout the history of religion that that changes. You move from belief in gods that are just like glorified humans to a belief in you know gods that are different from us or transcendent. You grow to a monotheistic faith, one that says that there is only one god. There are not many gods. Uh, and religion becomes more universal. He speaks, Hegel speaks about Christianity, and he considers himself a Christian. Um, he speaks of Christianity as the absolute religion. This is the absolute religion. This is the, the perfect religion. This is the height of religious understanding because of its universality. So Christianity says there is something that unites all people. Christianity is for all people, not just this group. In the self-understanding of the Geist is largely understanding of, of the interconnectedness between things. Um, so though Hegel praises Christianity and, and considers himself a Christian, at least in some way, he does not believe that theological truths, so the truths of, of Orthodox Christianity, Orthodox Lutheranism, he does not believe that they are literally true. He does not believe... Uh, in the literal truth of, say, the Nicene Creed. But he believes that there is a reality underneath those religious symbols that do manifest the truth. And you see this later with a figure like a Rudolf Bultmann, who speaks about demythologization in the 20th century. Um, so here's an example. Uh, and th there are many examples, but th this is probably the most popular one and one that Hegel relies on the most is the Trinity. So he, he wants to remain Trinitarian, and in his conception of Christianity as the absolute religion, he's got to do something not just with monotheism, um, of course, because he's saying Christianity is the absolute, not Islam, not Judaism. Uh, one is the universality, but also the, uh, the Trinitarian thought. So he says that the Trinity essentially manifests this dialectic that Hegel is proposing here. 
the Father, the infinite, becomes finite in the Son and then reveals himself to us as spirit or geist, right? So spirit, Holy Spirit becomes, uh, the Holy Spirit becomes kind of a stand-in for geist in this, in this system. So the Trinity reflects something that is true about Hegel's system, he's going to say. Um, and he's also going to say that the universality of Christianity reflects the unity of all things in this monistic system that he has. Uh, and then this leads us to the question, is Hegel a religious thinker? And this seems like this would be a very obvious question to answer. The same was true of Kant, that like people disagree. Um, there are different interpretations of Hegel. Uh, some think he's de devoted Lutheran and should be um, accepted as just this Orthodox Protestant or something. He's not. But... Um, <laughs> but uh, he also is interpreted in atheistic ways. There also are metaphysical versus non-metaphysical interpretations of Hegel. Um, the non-metaphysical interpretations hardly exist anymore because it's just kind of obvious that he's a very much a metaphysical thinker. But all right. So then it, to, to summarize, what are his major contributions? And then we'll look at you know, what impact he has on, on various thinkers after him. But his major contributions. So first... He views society as progressive, moving towards something greater. So there is this continual human progress. And that idea that you see in Hegel is certainly played out today in views of, of society. I mean, a progressive approach to uh, politics says that we are getting better. We are continuing to make progress as a society, and we need to move beyond the past in this process of growth. Uh, maybe toward utopia, maybe not. Hegel's not quite the utopian that Kant was. Uh, so whereas Kant says that he believes world peace is possible through this League of Nations that he discusses, uh, Hegel says no, that he, he doesn't come to the conclusion that that's possible. Uh, but many Hegel interpreters do become utopian, especially through Marx. Uh, Hegel is really influential for reintegrating metaphysics into philosophy. So questions of reality, of being. So the questions of reality, really a reality that could actually really be known in the Enlightenment, especially through the skepticism of a David Hume and then the development of that through Kant, people start to doubt whether we really know reality at all. Because all we know is just what impacts us. And Hegel is trying to go back to the earlier Greek philosophers and the earlier Christian tradition as well to say, no, there is a reality that's knowable. There is a reality that we can actually know. We could talk about what reality is. Uh, and he does that through this notion of, of the Geist. So he's doing it, but not in the way that classical philosophy has done. And so that's the next point that we have here. A shift from understanding timeless truths to historical reality. So uh, no longer, according to Hegel, should philosophers be looking for these universal timeless principles of absolute truth or absolute reality. Instead, we need to just be looking at history. We need to be looking at history in its process of self-development and the self-understanding of the Geist as it grows um, through, throughout time. So you see that philosophy is often going to become, for Hegel, really a philosophy of history rather than a philosophy of, say, formal logic. Uh, also, his approach to reality as a totality is highly influential. This notion that all reality kind of stands or falls together. All things in some way are one. You especially see this in the development of Marxist philosophy, uh, and especially in a lot of later Marxist philosophers who really root everything on totality. And, and they, this, which is why when they speak about revolution, they would say that this, the revolution that they're fighting for has to be a total revolution, overthrow of the past, because all things are connected. So uh, this view of reality as one, as a totality, um, uh, moving away from viewing reality as a bunch of distinct particular objects is something that happens in, in Hegel. But then we also have a moral relativism that arises in Hegel. And it's really unescapable that you come to a moral relativistic conclusion because in Hegel's philosophy, and he's been criticized for this a number of times, but in Hegel's philosophy, we can't talk about universal truths. So if we're not talking about universal moral truths, we're just talking about reality as it is. So that means that as society develops and as its views of various ethical issues develop, we just kind of have to go with what society says because that's where the geist is at right now. 
So it doesn't really leave a lot of, and this is, again, this is one of the major criticisms of Hegel, it doesn't really leave a lot of room for criticizing society, um, which is kind of ironic because Hegel gets used as a very much left-leaning thinker, but he's also used by fascist thinkers. This is the, the irony of, of Hegel. So that's what we're talking about here uh, with the, the influence of Hegel. So Hegel has a profound influence on everything past Hegel. Just like I said with Kant, where Kant has this massive influence beyond his lifetime. Everybody's still reckoning with the ideas of Kant. We could say the same exact thing about Hegel. Um, so we have the development of these two very different schools of thought that arise from Hegel. Now, one is a group known as the Young Hegelians, which then includes Karl Marx. Uh, the Young Hegelians are left-leaning Hegelians who believe that, uh, well, they take they take the idealist ideas and put them in a materialist framework. So they would say that this growth is not really any underlying non-material thing. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about exactly what he means by spirit, but they would say that it's really just the, the growth of the progress of material reality. So all that exists is material. And we can understand through historical materialism and Marx, he would say that we understand this growth of the world just by means of physical interactions, physical things bumping against physical things and doing physical things. But that is going to um, bring about revolution because part of this, this progress of the physical world growing um, is a growth toward a kind of utopia. And that's going to, to happen through the communist revolution. So capitalism is going to say as part of that we're growing out of that, right? That's one phase of, say, the, the Geist that we're moving out of into an era of, of socialism in Marx's view. So you have the young Hegelians who are using Hegel's philosophy to say we need a radical break from the past and radical revolution. On the other hand, we have uh, nationalism and authoritarianism, fascism, that is that is often called Hegelian as well. And the reason for that is, well, if you say, first of all, a couple things lead to nationalism. Um, one is Hegel speaking, like Kant does, about nations as subjects rather than just people. Um, another is that as he talks about the development of the Geist, he tends to focus on the state. And this also leads to, a, at least in the minds of some, a lack of any ability to really criticize what the state does because there aren't these universal timeless truths that you can use to judge the state. That's just where the Geist is now. You defend the state no matter what. Uh, and that leads to authoritarianism. So there are some, you've got problems on both the, the kind of the far right and the far left grab onto Hegel in different ways. Not in a, not those who are coming from a Christian perspective, but these are those who are, you know, on the far right fascist side of things and then on the Marxist side of things. Um, but Hegel also has an influence on more orthodox theology. So Erlingen, which is a school of theological thought in the 19th century in Germany. Um, a lot of those thinkers are impacted by some of Hegel's ideas. So people from, the point is all over the map from, you know, the far left to the far right to people who are relatively in the middle are influenced by Hegel in some way in various fields. He has a really huge impact on, on theology. Um, you have, first of all, um, and there are many ways he has an impact on theology, but here's just a brief summary of some of these. Um, F.C. Bauer. Bauer comes up with this, this hypothesis that ends up being quite popular, uh, which is this idea that Christianity formed out of these two opposed schools of thought. So that there is the uh, there was a Jewish school of thought that he identifies as Petrine Christianity. So he says this is kind of Peter's school, which is more Jewish. And then there's the more Hellenized or the more Greek school of thought that he would say comes from Paul. And Christianity becomes the religion it does because of the two, you know, say the thesis and the antithesis kind of coming together to form this synthesis. So the way people talk about development of religion, and this is just one example of that, becomes very influenced by Hegel's system. So they start applying what he's doing with history to um, the growth of, of uh, the history of Christianity. And you see this especially in the religions Geschichtlich school, uh, which is the history of religion school of thought that develops out of um, out of Hegel's writing, where Hegel starts to see this growth of historical process in terms of religion. So now you have, um, after Hegel, the development of a school of thought, which is going to study religions as natural 
historical development. So they're not going to see religion as anything supernatural. They're not going to say it's supernatural revelation. Uh, they're going to say instead it's just natural product of what happens in human history. And so they come up with this whole idea of, you know, it starts with animism and then polytheism and then ethical monotheism. And then that leads to um, whatever. Uh, the, uh, this is something that still exists, but oftentimes the earlier schools thought that where they were at was kind of the, the height of religious development. Okay. Um, then we have the development of process theism. Alfred North Whitehead is a major figure here, though he's not the only one. Um, so we have process theology that, as we understand in Hegel, the world spirit growing, people start to speak of God in that way, uh, that God is in this historical process uh, himself, that he is constantly changing. So in a lot of uh, liberal churches, you see this kind of pro process theology show up in different ways. You know, you go to your local UCC church, it's probably Hegelian in some sense because it's probably influenced by process theism because it is very likely that uh, there is an idea that God is constantly changing and, and the world is changing and he's just kind of changing with it and improving and growing himself. Um, which means that you really have no, re you know, religious authority other than what you decide God is doing because there's no, like, objective universal truth that's in scripture or anywhere else that you use to guide your system of thought. It's just what the world spirit is today, I guess. Okay, then you have the um, theology of hope. Uh, the theology of hope, uh, <laughs> to be clear, these figures are going to say they're not Hegel or Hegelian. Uh, Jensen uh, argues very adamantly against that when Thomas Wynandy accused him of being Hegelian, but I think he is. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean self-consciously so, but the theology of hope is a perspective of, of theism which puts the future, um, eschatology, uh, last things, uh, as, as kind of the root of all things. So every theological conclusion kind of drawn from eschatology or last things, and that includes God's own being. So there's this notion that God ends up being future to himself. The spirit is the future of God. I don't have the time to get into all of the complexities. And these three figures all believe different things, by the way, but they're all generally theology of hope. Um, figures. But the point is, this has an impact on Christian theologians, I think, in, in other ways that people start to challenge questions of things like God's timelessness, the notion that God exists outside of time. God is part of historical process or within historical process for some of these thinkers. Now, they're not going to go as far as the process theologians are, but they're, they're challenging the, the convictions that there are these universal, objective, what they would call static realities that Christianity grows out of. Uh, and they are, in one sense, they're right. So I would say in one sense, they're saying that in Christianity, we do have the historical realities of the death and resurrection of Christ as central. Uh, to our faith. I mean, right, the Christian faith is dependent upon historical reality. It's not just dependent on timeless abstract truths. Um, so they see, I think, a kind of kindred thinker in Hegel in some ways on some of these points. Um, Karl Barth said that he was fond of a little Hegeling sometimes. Uh, so so Barth's influenced by Hegel as well. So a lot of modern thinkers are. Um, other philosophies grow out of Hegel in some ways, or at least respond to him. Existentialism, um, grows in some ways out of what Hegel does. Kierkegaard is going to challenge Hegel, but so Hegel in that way helps form some of Kierkegaard's philosophy. Um, pragmatism, uh, the philosophy known as pragmatism, which gets popular, especially in the United States, is based upon these non-metaphysical readings of Hegel, um, that he's not really talking about reality at all, which generally is rejected today. Um, there aren't a lot of non-metaphysical uh, arguments for understanding Hegel anymore. Nonetheless, that is what forms a lot of, of what we see with pragmatism, especially in, in America. Okay, so this is a, a complicated topic. I didn't even touch on a lot of uh, points of, of Hegel, but uh, this was kind of bird's eye view, trying to explain it all uh, as simply as I can. This may be one of those talks where you have to go back and listen again. <laughs> so that's just how Hegel is. <laughs> I tried to make it as simple as I possibly could. Uh, but uh, let me know what other uh, talks you want me to do in the series, figures that you'd like to see me explore. And uh, I will continue this as long, uh, you know, along with all of my other series that I do as well. So uh, anyway, we'll see you in the next one. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet on YouTube and on your podcast app. We'll see you in the next one. God bless.